Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christoph Conrad, and I'm a technical evangelist for uh, Adobe, working specifically on the, on the Flex uh, product. I'm based in Boston. You can hear that, so I'm still trying to get rid of my New England accent. It's hard. Um, so today we are going to cover that. I didn't come up with the title, so I'm not even going to try to to read it to you. Some PR you know, people found that it was a kind of a nice title, and obviously it worked since you're still sitting here. Um, but, but really, we are, we are going to cover, obviously, that topic. And um, in a nutshell, what we are going to cover is really what uh, the client means to SOA or what SOA means to the client and how we can really you know, completely change the way end users interact with user interfaces. So that's in a nutshell uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, I want to make this extremely entertaining, if possible, meaning that I'm not going to show you 50 slides. I actually have three slides. And what I'm going to show you is a lot of examples of what people have been building, um, you know, based on these concepts here. Um, what you can build is one thing, and then how you build it is another thing. And so the second part of my presentation, if you want, is going to be really about how you can build these things, because I think that that's still one of the major problems that you have. You know, we see all these nice demos and applications, but then to build them, it's a very different story. And, and we are not all rocket scientists, and we don't all have three years to build an application. So what I will show you is some of the techniques that you can uh, actually use to uh, build these applications. So that's the agenda in a nutshell. Um, this is really my intro slide, and I think uh, Scott covered uh, a lot of that in the keynote, so I'm not going to repeat too much uh, of what he said, but I think that the bottom line is, how many people are Java developers in the room? It's a developer's track. How many people are .NET? Wow, okay. How many people are like PHP? None. Wow. Ruby? A few. Okay. Wow. It's really the first time that I have that kind of mix. Interesting. So the bottom line, as I said, is that for the last 10 years, or at least for the nine years before this last year, if you asked some of you probably, or some of these, you know, super geeky J2E or .NET architects, what the application really was, where the core of the application sat in your architecture. All of them, almost, would have told you, you know, it's really at the server side, because that's where you encapsulate your business logic, that's where, that's where you apply all these nice design patterns and, and all that great stuff. So that's really where the application is. And the user interface really happens to be some kind of data capture device that we have to have because, you know, obviously at some point we need some data. But it really doesn't matter that much because, you know, the application is really in the business tier, integration tier, resource tier. And we have some technologies to take care, you know, of the client like, you know, ASP, JSP, PHP, and all these things. And so I think what happened during the last year or maybe the last two years is that that way of looking at things completely changed and people realized that from the end user point of view the only thing that matters is the user interface and the experience with the application and they couldn't care less if your business logic is nicely encapsulated in a web service they don't care all they care about is how they can interact with the application and um, sure, you know, if we look at um, what has been done during the last year with Ajax or the last two years, um, you know, a lot of progress has been made at the client side. And the reason I think that um, people actually uh, started to focus on the, on the client side um, is also because they figured that the server side was pretty stable and we all moved towards what we call an SOA, a service-oriented architecture. But what we found out is that if the server side was SOA, the client side was not at all. And I'll give you a simple example and maybe you came across the same type of problem. So people in your company and maybe you spend five, ten years, you know, coming up to these different architecture that kind of culminated to, you know, maybe web services and things like that. So now you're ready to build a client. 
and maybe now you are the client developer and you speak with the server side developer and you say, okay, tell me how I can get data. Tell me how I can access that business logic. And then the server side developer says, well, that's very simple. We have nicely encapsulated everything in, a, in web services. So at the client side, you just invoke my web service. And what do you say? Well, I can't because my client platform doesn't allow me to invoke web services. I'm, you know, I'm using HTML, maybe with some Ajax, and I just can't invoke web services. So can you please, server-side developer, go back to your server-side stuff and transform that web, you know, create a little adapter there in the middle so that your web service can actually, you know, you invoke your web service at the server-side, but make sure that you send me plain XML. And the server-side developer is like, well, doesn't that defeat the purpose? Why should I actually transform, uh, you know, my nice SOA to again, you know, publish the data, expose the data in something that your limited client technology can actually invoke? And so that's why we, we kind of, you know, say here that if the, the server, if the backend is SOA, Oftentimes, you will find out that your client is not really ready to exploit, to take advantage, to leverage uh, what people have done at the server side. So as we mentioned in this slide, you know, there is no native SOA connectivity. The model is still very much request response. If you need data, you have to ask the server. Well, sometimes that's not how it works. Sometimes you would like the server to push data to you. Okay, so again, how are you going to do that? So there are some limitations there um, at the client side that we would like to overcome. And if we overcome these limitations, then we will have, you know, what we can really call a service-oriented client, a client that is able to take advantage of anything you have done at the server side. All these great investments that you have done at the server side, you'll, you'll be able to leverage, whether it's web services, you know, your nice design patterns, messaging, if you have implemented messaging at the, at the server side, wouldn't it be nice if the client could actually leverage that and listen to the messages that are sent at the server side. Well, a traditional, you know, HTML and sometimes even Ajax client is not going to be able to do that. So we need to improve that a little bit and there is some work uh, that we can still do to make this client a real uh, service-oriented client. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, a path to what I would call here high-definition user interfaces, to kind of, you know, make an analogy to your television. Uh, I think that if you look at your clients today and some of the things that have been demoed this morning and that you see every day on the web, it's cool. It's way, way better than what we had two years ago. A lot better. And, you know, many websites still have to implement all that but it's still very limited by the underlying platform. We can still do a lot better than that. If you take that analogy with your television, this is still not high definition. It's a lot better. It's color if you want, but it's not high definition. And there are a couple of things that are missing. And I will quickly go through uh, these things, and then I'm going to be done with my slides. The first thing that you know, I think is missing is what we call expressiveness. And by expressiveness, we mean, you know, being able to, the end user being able to interact with objects in your user interface as if they were real life objects, meaning, you know, reshape them, stretch them, rotate them, and things like that. Well, you can't really do that today natively in a browser because that requires something that we call vector graphics. And if you had vector graphics, if you had vector graphics, you could really do a lot more and make user interfaces that are a lot more interesting and also a lot more intuitive. And I will show you examples of that. The second thing that I think can be improved at the client side is performance. You know, at some point, you can squeeze, you can zip, you can cache, you can compress as much as you want. What really matters at the end of the day is the underlying virtual machine that is running your application. And if the browser is running interpreting JavaScript is good enough to display web pages, 
If you're building a mission-critical application, let's say, for instance, you're building you know, a trader's desktop where you send, you push you know, hundreds of updates in real time from the server to the client, at some point, believe me, you're going to need a real virtual machine that doesn't inter interpret code, but that runs byte code, like you know, a Java virtual machine or, or something of that nature. Squeezing, compressing, and all that stuff is not really going to be enough, depending on the type of application that you're building. If you're really speaking about mission-critical application, you are going to need a virtual machine with a just-in-time compiler and things like that. So that's one thing that we need to improve. And the, 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 the next one is very much related to what I just said. The ability to change the way you get data, the ability to change the way you get information, Right now, most of the time, if you think about the, the web applications that you are using, you have to ask, typically the server, do you have data for me? Right? That's pretty much how it works because that's the web model. It's request-response. You make a request, you get a response. Sometimes you don't know if there is data waiting for you, so you have to ask the server anyway, do you happen to have data waiting for me? But sometimes the server knows, ooh, something happened, and I know that that client would be really interested because the Google stock just reached 500, and I really want to sell everything I have because one week later it's like 480-something. So I really need to know that, okay? Wouldn't it be good if, you know, by default, Web technologies were able to do that without all sorts of, you know, fancy ways or hacky ways, I should say, to, to actually implement that stuff. So this should be available as a kind of a first-class protocol to, to kind of enable that type of applications. And, you know, a stock is not, is not the, only, the only example, but some of you might wonder, you know, there are a couple of applications out there today, like, for instance, an instant messaging client. Yeah, sure, you have some web-based versions of these instant messaging clients, but the, you know, the, the real version of Yahoo messaging or MSN or whatever, or AOL, they run as a, as a desktop application. Why? Well, because they need that in a reliable, scalable, fast way. And today they can't really implement that, uh, you know, with all these characteristics in the browser. The next thing that's going to happen uh, to make these user interfaces high definition is deep integration of rich media. And again, you know, like a few months ago, people told me, oh, you know, video, who cares? You know, does it really matter? Why do I need video? And then Google acquired YouTube for 1.6 billion, and people said, ooh, video is cool. Maybe I should look into, you know, polishing my skills around video. Uh, but if you think about YouTube, you know, it's a pretty simple app, obviously worth a lot of money but it's an extremely simple app. It's pretty much like posting pictures, but they happen to be videos, but you share videos, and, and that's kind of, you know, video 1.0. What video 2.0 is going to be is that these videos are going to interact with your application, or you are going to be able to interact with these videos. And maybe you missed that uh, a few years back, I think it was two years ago, that Amazon actually already had video 2.0 uh, around, you know, Christmas, where they had these short movies, these short films, uh, you know, with famous actors. Like, for instance, you could see Denzel Washington playing with an iPod. But in that video, the, 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 the iPod, sorry, was a hyperlink. And you could click on the iPod in the video as the video was you know, playing and the iPad was moving in the video, it remained a hyperlink. And you could click on it and buy, guess what, obviously buy it on Amazon. So this is more than just passive streaming of video. This is really you interacting with the video. This is interactive video. Video can also drive your UI. If you are in financial services, for instance, you can imagine your, you know, tr stock trading guru talking to you about tips and techniques. And as the guy is talking, that talking, heads, that talking head, you have some charting components, you know, synchronized based on what he says to kind of illustrate what, what the guy is saying. 
So this is video driving your UI. So a lot more than just passive streaming of video. And you're going to see a lot of that in business applications and in consumer-centric applications. And the last piece that's going to happen and that's going to be a, a, a big shift is that people want to take these applications offline. And sometimes people really want these applications to behave like desktop applications. You know, I, I use the example of the instant messaging client, right? Well, one reason it's still done as a desktop application is because you need real time. But another reason is that if you do IM, you don't want to leave like a browser window open there just in case someone wants to talk to you. Right? You need that application to behave like a desktop application and to pop up an alert or a message box if someone wants to talk to you. Another example is iTunes. Ever wondered why iTunes is not a web application? Well, there are, there are many reasons why iTunes is not a web application, but wouldn't it be nice if you could actually play music stored on your local disk? That's kind of a basic minimum requirement. And guess what? You can't really do that in a browser. You, and for good reasons, there is a security sandbox, but you cannot access you know, stuff on your local hard disk. That's, you know, for, for many applications, that's great because you want that security sandbox, but if you are in a trusted environment, that's pretty limiting in what you can do. And wouldn't it be nice also if you could start iTunes when you are bored on an airplane, right? And you don't have access to the Internet. Right? So be able to start that application as a desktop application. So we are going to see a lot of that, and I will show you some, some really interesting examples. And finally, the last uh, consideration for you know, that move towards high-definition user interfaces is the concept of the programming model. And again, that's what I spoke about initially. It's one thing to be able to technically be able to do things. And it's another thing to do it in a way that makes sense, in a way that you can work, uh, you know, as a development team on, you know, because it's a strong foundation. You can implement all your traditional, you know, uh, software engineering practices and methodologies and things like that. So one thing that I will do now and shifting gears is look at these five categories of things that we think are going to be extremely important. And so that's going to be the first part of my, the remaining of my talk, and then I will show you how to, to actually build that. So uh, let me uh, stop with these slides, as I promised, because I took 15 minutes to cover two slides. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you a variety of things. Some are small gadgets, like the first one here, and some will be full-blown business applications, mi mission-critical applications. How many people have used the new iTunes? Okay. Does, oh, okay, great. So does this look familiar? This type of user interface? Some people say yes. So that's one of the features of the new iTunes. And of course, they don't use pictures. These are, you know, in iTunes, they are CD covers. And people came to me one day and said, you know, could you, this is really cool kind of UI. This looks very high definition. Can you actually do this in Flex? And I was thinking about it. And the next day, I read the blog of one of the Flex engineers, and he posted this component uh, on his blog. Now, what's unique about this is that this is an example of a user interface that requires vector graphics. And that requires, you see that there is reflection at the bottom of, the, you know, of the, uh, each picture. So uh, to, to be able to do that, you need bitmap manipulation and things like that. You need to be able to rotate things, to scale things, to change the shape of images. You need vector graphics. You need bitmap manipulations and things like that. So that's something that you couldn't really do if you didn't have vector graphics and if you didn't have uh, you know, bitmap manipulation. And that's the kind of experience that people are you know, using now when they use iTunes. So, you know, the bar is being set and people expect that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, some of you are saying, okay, you know, um, wrong session here because this is really not what I'm building. I'm building, you know, business applications. How many, how many people are building business applications as opposed to, okay. All right, so don't leave the room yet, okay? Uh, let's take this one. 
Okay, so this is more of hopefully you're lo uh, what you're looking for. So this is a prototype that we built with a, um, uh, for an insurance company. And they came to us, and maybe some of you can recognize the branding if you are a customer. And they came to us and they said, you know, we are behind in terms of user experience. People are complaining. The completion rates on our website is a complete disaster because people get lost. They don't understand the user interface. They, they give up and they end up calling, you know, the call center, which defeats the purpose of having, you know, an online presence to do all that. So they came to us and they said, well, you guys, you know, Macromedia and now Adobe, you seem to have some experience in, you know, building cool UIs, so can you actually help us? And so we build that prototype for them. So the, the use case here is, it's, you know, hypothetical, you had an accident, it's just, you know, a, a, a use case here. All right, so you have things like are pretty boring now. You know, when I did that two years ago, people clapped. Said, Ooh, look, there is a red rectangle, you know, around the, the thing to say that it's not valid. And now people at best laugh, but, you know. So, okay, don't worry, there is more to it than this. Um, so you have things like, uh, you know, in-context help. You know, okay, so I really don't know what to, to enter here, so give me contextual help. You know, don't lose me, you know, moving to another page. Just give me in-context help. Okay, now I got it. I know what I have to type here. Okay, so that's my, that's my username. Okay, things like that. And, and I could continue like that. So one, one thing that they insisted on was that the process, the workflow, in their existing website was not clear at all. So they asked us to come up with a way to kind of visualize it. So we said, okay, well, we could do things like that. And if you look at the top, what you're looking at looks very much like a progress bar, and you see where you stand in that process. So they kind of like that. And plus, the animation makes you really feel, okay, I'm done with that next page. I'm done with that next step, if you want. I shouldn't use the word page here. And so you, you enter your driver information. So that's pretty boring. So let's move to the next step. And I need to uh, specify my uh, vehicle information. And because it's all about the environment these days, I'm going to take a Prius, and I'm going to choose a color. And now I'm moving to the next uh, step. And now I, ne I need to define what happened to my car, how my car was damaged. Now, if you had to do that recently using a traditional website, all you have to express yourself is a big text area. And some people are really good at, you know, explaining, and some people are really bad. And so it was, it was not very useful for the, the insurance company, the typical information that was provided in that big text area. So they came to us and said, you know, this is still data entry, but help me make it, first of all, more fun uh, for the end user so that they will actually want to do that, but also more useful for us to really understand what happened. And so we came up with this, and so, you know, this is the car that you selected, and you can mouse over, and, but not only can you mouse over, you can actually say, okay, this is what happened to my car, and now I'm going to select another piece, and this is what happened. And so, again, what we are doing here, what we are doing here is data entry. This is data entry, but obviously it's a different way of doing data entry. And to do these things, you need features like being able to draw over existing objects, so again, you will need vector graphics and things like that. But at the end of the day, you just have something that's easier to use and just more useful. So that was kind of cool. They, they, they loved that, and that's going to be implemented. And then the next step was to describe how that happened, right? So tell me, you know, how it happened. And again, in the traditional website, all you had was a text area. Now, here we push the envelope just a little bit, and you'll tell me if you like it. But here we go. And so this is maybe still a little visionary today. Maybe people are not ready for this yet, but they will be soon. And, you know, you need to kind of embrace a technology that, that's going to allow you to do these things. So first of all, you can, you can uh, select a, a, sp a specific uh, configuration of, you know, a traffic intersection or something like that. And so you can say now, okay, well, so here's what happened. I was trying to make a right here. And this crazy guy, you know, had a long night in Vegas, 
and he came from the left, didn't see me, and boom, this is the place of the impact. Now, a little visionary, I will admit, but this is still data entry. This is data entry. Believe it or not, we are able to read this and really make sense of this information. Again, choose the opposite approach where all you have is, you know, a text area. How can you really describe it with the level of precision and things like this? This is almost as good as a picture to kind of express your view of how it happened. And so this is what I would call you know, a high-definition user interface. See the process here, very, understand, uh, very understandable, um, and also some really cool ways to do data entry. So this is for expressiveness. Now, expressiveness is used in all sorts of applications, and sometimes, I hope the internet connection is working here, sometimes in small, um, you know, uh, places, like this is Google Finance. Some people you know, try to portray Google as an Ajax, you know, just 100% 100 Ajax company. My experience looking at their website is that they actually use the technology that makes sense for the problem that they are trying to solve. And here, this is live Google Finance, so you can go on this page and look at the Google stock, but you want to look at the, you know, you want to look at the history of the Google stock. And to, to be able to look at the history of the stock or to kind of zoom in here, you, you really need to be able to redraw stuff, you know, to redraw these charting components. The opposite experience that you had before that is every single time you modify one of these search criteria, you would go back to the server and the server would recreate a chart as a bitmap and then send you that back. And so from the user point of view, it would be very kind of, you know, annoying because you lose context and you lose the trend. Now, because I'm able to drag that thing, I can really understand the trend because I have that concept that we call visual continuity, meaning that my eye always follows what happens. If you give me a brand new bitmap, I lost that context. So to be able to do things like these, you need vector graphics. You need to be able to redraw these things at the client side. And of course, because Google did it, um, Yahoo had to do it too. Uh, and here we go. They, they did it later, but bigger. So I guess it's better. All right. Uh, and so you have the exact same thing here, the ability to kind of just, you know, take some stocks, take some indicators, and just drag that thing around. The key thing is, you know, we are all like geeks, right? And we kind of know that you can't really do that in HTML. So we know that something else is involved here. But the average user, you know, looking at this and interacting with this doesn't know and doesn't need to know, and it's a good thing that, you know, it's not visible, that this is still, you know, a very, um, you know, consistent user interface, even though some of the page is built in HTML. And some of the, uh, the, the pieces, some of the modules of this application is actually built using a technology called Flex or Flash, and we'll speak about that in a second, that gives you some of these missing features that I was talking about before. Okay? So this is expressiveness in different contexts. Uh, let me uh, shift gears a little bit and speak about real time. And I will start with a very, very, very small example, and it's going to be a mashup because I heard that it's all about mashups. So let's do a mashup, but an interesting mashup. Mashing up and then doing things that you couldn't do, you know, using, you know, the traditional web. So this is, in the background, what you're looking at is Google Maps, okay? The traditional Google Maps, I didn't change a thing. Now, that little purple box on top is actually an application built with the Adobe technology called Flex, and we'll speak a little bit about that uh, in a second, even though this is also not a sales pitch. This is more about, uh, you know, speaking about the different technologies out there. So on top there, it's just a Flex application. And the use case is, I'm going to visit New York, and I don't know anything about New York. So I'm going to enter a collaboration session with my friend John, who happens to live in New York and knows everything about New York. So I'm simulating on my computer uh, John's session in New York and my session in Boston. Okay, so the first thing that we can do because we are collaborating is that, you know, when I will move the map, 
uh, automatically, a Jones application is going to be synchronized to look at the same thing that I'm looking at. So this is a small thing. And some of you will say, okay, well, no big deal. You know, I can start WebEx or NetMeeting or Breeze or whatever and do the same thing. It's just collaboration. But again, the idea behind mashups is that you don't want to start another application. It has to happen in context. You are looking at Google Maps, and all of a sudden, you want to bring someone in and collaborate with you um, without asking that person to start a brand new application. So to be able to do things like this, you need PubSub messaging. This is enabled by publish subscribe messaging, which is not a feature that's natively available in a browser. So when I move the map on the left, what happens is that I send a very small message to a messaging destination, okay? And John subscribed to that messaging destination is, and is going to get that message in real time. And that message is very small. It's just the coordinates, the new coordinates of my map. And so he's going to get these coordinates and be able to adjust his uh, user interfaces. So not only is it in context, but it's also a lot cheaper on the network compared to full-blown you know, collaboration applications where you have to share the screen, and obviously that's a lot heavier on the network. Another thing that you know, I spoke about was rich media integration, and this is just a, a different take on rich media integration. It's not a static you know, movie that you post somewhere, but it's actually a live video stream. And being able to do that and integrate that in your application is also something that can be really interesting that's not natively supported in a browser, but that you can actually do very, very easily uh, today. And the last thing, of course, uh, still related to uh, real-time stuff is, well, if we look at the map, wouldn't it be nice if I could whiteboard and John could tell me, no, no, don't take that route, uh, go this way. Not literally, but you get the idea. Now, this is a small app, but that thing that I just did uses very sophisticated technologies, like, first of all, a drawing API, which, again, is not available natively in a browser, but also pub -sub messaging. How do you synchronize that? How do you make sure that John sees in real time what I'm drawing? Well, again, I'm publishing very small messages with the coordinates of the points that I draw on the left, and John is going to get these coordinates, and his client application is going to be able to follow along and make sure that you know, the two user interfaces are in sync. Now, again, you're going to say, okay, this is a nice gadget, a nice toy, but this is not really what I'm building. Uh, so let me show you a more of a business application here. So this is, a, this is a dashboard. This is a sales dashboard. Nice charting components, and the application is interesting in its own right because, again, you don't need to go back to the server to, to, to change the shape of things, to you know, redraw things, to rotate things, to animate things. Look, that very simple thing here would be impossible to do if you didn't have vector graphics. And this is not a gadget. Many people say, I don't need animation in my business application because it's all gadget. It really doesn't help me. Well, I would make the case that in this very simple use case, it really helps me a lot. Simply this, to see that very you know, immediately, visually, that Europe is doing a lot better than Japan. Okay? Because again, I have visual continuity. I see the data trends and it gives me immediate feedback. And again, you know, you can completely redraw at the client side and that kind of nice stuff. You get the idea. Okay, so that's by itself a kind of a cool app, right? A, a better way to build uh, dashboard applications. And that's all running, uh, you know, inside your browser. But again, wouldn't it be cool if you could actually uh, use the same concepts I demonstrated before and have a collaboration session in context that doesn't require you to say, hey, John, please start WebEx now or whatever you know, web conferencing you are using because we are going to collaborate. Now, you are working on that thing just like you can invite someone in IM. Wouldn't it be nice if you could invite someone in your application and start to say, hey, John, you know, what do you think about Europe? And, and John says, well, look at North America, and you know, what if we kind of 
you know, limit the reporting period here, and you see that whatever I'm doing in one session is reflected in the other session. That's, again, real-time messaging. I simply send messages around, and people who are listening are able to react, and we can collaborate. We think that that's going to be one of the big things moving forward, um, you know, um, on the web. A last example of this type of interactions is this one. Um, and so, again, a completely different use case, a, a more of a business um, a, a website. The use case here is that I'm applying for a mortgage. And how many people are dealing with call center type of applications? A few of you? Yes, a few of you. Okay. And after this, you will all want to do it, hopefully. So I'm, you know, I'm applying for a mortgage. Pretty painful process again. At some point, I will say, okay, I really want to apply. And again, we try to make what used to be a very complex multi-pages process, we try to make that a very simple UI to understand from the end user point of view. So we use these... Uh, what we call um, accordion, uh, accordion panel here to make it really easy. But that's not the point. You have seen applications like that. My insurance uh, uh, example wa was similar to this. The use case here is that at some point, you're going to get stuck because you don't know how to, to enter some data in your application. So you're going to ask for help, and we kind of you know, slide a, a panel from the right. That's all uh, really cool. Uh, what I'm going to show you now, it's going to be hard to do on one screen, but you're going to get um, the picture. This is the application that a support rep in a call center would use. Like in this case, we would call that a mortgage consultant. That sounds better. Okay. And, and so this person on the right is just waiting for people to get in trouble on the left. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm in trouble. I need a live mortgage consultant. And here is Lucinda. Oh, how can I help you today? That's the only part of my presentation that's fake. Lucinda was not uh, waiting for us, but all the rest is actually uh, real. Um, what is real among other things, is that a ticket was created in her application. Hey, someone is in trouble, and Lucinda is going to say, okay, I can take care of that. I'm going to help that person. Immediately, she has a view of my mortgage application in her um, you know, uh, own application there. And so what she can do, among other things, is drive, remotely drive my application. So again, this is in-context collaboration. Imagine if Lucinda had to tell me, well, you know, I could potentially help you, but do you have WebEx installed on your machine? And can you please start a WebEx? No. I'm, you know, it's hard enough for me to go through that process. Can you please help me right there in context? I don't want to shift context. I don't want to start anything else. So she can do that using PubSub messaging, using real time. And in addition to that, and that's really cool, we can share information. We can share data. If we both point to the same data set, and I will show how to build that in a second, um, she can say, you know, I identified your problem. You didn't fill in your address. Well, let me help you with that because I happen to know your address. And you see that whatever she types here is automatically appearing, you know, in real time in my application. So that's collaboration, co-filling of you know, forms and things like that. Again, this is powered, uh, you know, by PubSub messaging. And the best thing about all this, and that's what I told you when we started, is that it's one thing to be able to do this, but it's another thing to see how it's done. And what I will show you at the end of my presentation is that this is actually free of code. You can really easily build that in fact, without writing a single line of code, this is built on top of messaging. So we covered expressiveness. We covered uh, rich media a little bit. Lucinda was another example of that. Uh, we covered real time. What about performance? That was also one of my you know, criteria to, to become high definition in terms of the user uh, interface. So let me show you the least sexy um, application that you'll probably see, you know, in this entire conference. So, and, and by the way, this is plain HTML and AJAX, this version. 
so very simple application. I'm going to say, you know what? I have a, data, a local database running here, and I specify a number of rows that I want to retrieve from my database. And the application will simply display these rows in this big box, which is basically an HTML table. And I will start with a 1,000 rows. I'm going to say, OK, well, thank you very much. Here we go. And you see that at the bottom, we have the time it took, which was just over two seconds to retrieve a 1,000 rows. So that's OK. Some of you will say, OK, I can deal with that. So let's push the envelope a little bit and say, you know, I want to retrieve 5,000 rows now. And now I have time to talk to you. Because what's happening here is that, you know, we send that request to the server. XML is being sent back to the client. Ooh, the browser is panicking here, saying, hey, this thing is taking way too long. Are you sure that you really want to execute this script? And I will say, yes, I really need 5,000 rows here. So I'm going to say continue. Uh, and so when the, the client receives 5,000 rows in XML, now I'm busy in JavaScript loop, looping through you know, my 5,000 rows in XML and you know, programmatically kind of you know, displaying these things in my table. 26 seconds, of course, I cheated a little bit because the time I spoke while that dialogue was you know, on my screen is, is counted. But you get the idea. That's not acceptable. 26 seconds, or even if it was 15, or even 10, it's not acceptable if you are building you know, a kind of a data-intensive application. Now, sometimes you know, I felt, who would ever want to retrieve 5,000 rows at once at the client side? And you know, I always try to partition things. And, and you know, when I presented this, I always said, you know, if you really had, and then, you know, because I, I live in Boston, I speak a lot to financial services organizations, and they tell me, whew, 5,000 rows is nothing. We have to retrieve, you know, tens of thousands of rows at the client side. And, you know, um, I never argue with a customer, so I said, well, if you really need to do that, we need to find a solution. Uh, and the reason I'm showing that here is because, you know, even though I think you know we can do a lot with you know some of the, the the technologies that are available natively in the browser you are not going to do everything and you know 10 years ago if you're old enough to to remember that when java came uh, you know up or a little uh, before that some people who used to uh, build applications in c++ said i'm never going to use java because it has that concept of a virtual machine and it's never going to be fast enough for the applications that i'm building and some people, you know, had that argument for years. And now some people say, well, you know, using JavaScript in the browser, you, you can do everything. You can do a lot, but you can't do everything. There are applications that are just not going to work with the current level of performance that you get from JavaScript being interpreted in a browser. And sometimes, as you will see, a virtual machine uh, working with a just-in-time compiler is going to make somewhat of a difference. And I'm going to use the exact same application here and say I want to retrieve 5,000 rows. And as you can see, it took 350 milliseconds. Now, the code to parse that XML is actually you know, not interpreted in JavaScript, but is actually uh, compiled bytecode executed with an ECMAScript script for virtual machine which is the language, the underlying language in Flex and Flash-based uh, solutions. That we also, if you uh, happen to miss that, we happen to donate that to uh, Mozilla. A few weeks back, we, we announced that we open-sourced uh, the Flash virtual machine. And so there is a new project um, that we um, are part of on, uh, you know, with Mozilla, uh, to continue to develop that ECMAScript, so some people call that JavaScript 2, a virtual machine, because we realize that if you, if you really want to do more and move more applications to the web, and you really want desktop-like performance, well, interpreted JavaScript is not going to give you desktop-like performance. As much as you can squeeze it and zip it and all that, at some point, you need a real virtual machine. So let's go back to my, to my application. So we, we, we had 5,000 rows. Now let's be a lot more aggressive and say, I want to retrieve 20,000 rows. 
and you will see that it's going to do it's still going to do that in less than one second okay so that's the the kind of difference now let me show you something else here something that i would never do with plain html or plain javascript is this see what i'm doing i'm sorting 20,000 rows at the client side now this is the performance that you expect from a desktop application, right? You simply click, boom. Sometimes it looks even better than what I get in Outlook. But so this is the kind of performance that you expect. Now try to do that in plain JavaScript and let me tell you the, the, the result is going to be completely different. And it's normal. That's, you know, JavaScript was not really meant to do that kind of really heavy processing at the client side. Another example of where you would need that type of performance is this. Um, I'm going to start a feed here. So I've been talking a little bit about, um, you know, real-time traders desktop uh, application. So uh, the use case here is I'm a Wall Street guy and or I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a, a day trader, whatever the situation is, and I need to, to you know, monitor the market in real time. So I'm going to log on here. Um, here we go. And I subscribed to a bunch of stocks. And I want the, the market updates in real time. And I can actually continue to, to subscribe to stocks. I think I didn't have GM. And automatically, you know, it's being picked up and I see the stocks. And I can have 50 stocks in here. And because we have that performance of a virtual machine, so to do this, you need two things. You need the ability to push data in real time, but at the client side, you need the performance to keep up with all these updates. You know, when I have five or six here, maybe it's not a big deal. If you have 50, you need the performance to be able to keep up with that. And as you are doing this, the performance to be able to have your user interface still working and being able to update charts in real time and zoom in, zoom out, and maybe look at the history of a stock uh, in, again, in a nice animated way and move things around like this. And you see that as I'm doing heavy duty stuff in terms of performance, my UI is still extremely responsive. All right, and now I'm gonna stop that. Okay, so that was just a, a, you know, a, a, a couple of examples of what you can do and you know, how we see user interfaces evolving towards what I called high definition user interfaces. Now the question is, how do you actually build that? And some of you might be concerned because I said that we would cover that and you, you're looking at your watch and, and you think he has only 10 minutes to do that. And so that's the point. We're gonna try to do that in 10 minutes. So I didn't want to emphasize the technology that was used uh, to build this because I think that's not really the key point. The, the first point is to understand where we are going, where all these user interfaces are going, and really understand that you know, what you're seeing today is I think just a beginning. I, as I said, a year ago there was a major shift. People all of a sudden said, you know what, we think that that backend stuff, it's pretty stable now. We can start to focus again on what matters from the, from the end user point of view. And so if you think about it that way, it has only been a year since people have been focusing on the client again. So that's nothing. You know, a lot of things, if you consider that people had been, like if you're in the J2E and even .NET world, working on backend for 10 years. So what's the user interface going to look like 10 years from now? And I think that what you saw today are some of the characteristics of these user interfaces. Performance, expressiveness, real-time, collaboration, offline, I still have to show uh, that to you in a second, and so I need to get going now. So the product that we are working on uh, at Adobe is called Flex, and Flex is uh, really a programming model to enable you to build these applications. And uh, the end result is actually delivered as flash bytecode. So if you are familiar with Flash, it's the end result is a Swift file, SWF, which is really the, the Flash bytecode format. The big difference with Flash, so the end result is the same thing if you want, but the big difference is the way you actually build your application. Um, you know, we listened to developers like you and they told us, you know, we love the end result, but we hate 
the way you have to build things in Flash. So what we wanted to build is a platform uh, that works for developers. And, you know, the first thing that you will notice here is that it works in Eclipse, so that's the development environment. You don't have to use Eclipse because it's all text-based. You can use the ID of your choice. And, and by the way, we have the, the SDK is free, just like Java. So you can go on the Adobe website and download the Flex SDK for free and build a lot of the things that you have seen uh, today. Some, you know, some server pieces, if you need a server, like, for instance, to do the real-time stuff, you know, the server is not free, but many applications can be built without a server entirely for free. What we also sell is the, is the tool if you uh, want to use it, but again, you don't need it. Okay, let me take five minutes to build something significant with you. So uh, it's built in Eclipse. You have a design view and a um, code view. So I will start in the design view. You know, as always, you can grab components from a component palette and drop them on the screen. And like, for instance, I'll paste a button here. I will add it there. I will label that button. So we try to make it easy to build a UI without writing code because many people like to do things that way. And for instance, I will add a data grid here just to show you the, the different layout management uh, policies that we have. Like for instance, we have constraint-based layout where you can simply say that that thing, that data grid, uh, what did I do wrong here? That data grid, let me, oh sorry, not 100, but zero. That data grid should actually stick to the borders of my panel, okay? So this is constraint-based layout. You're basically saying leave zero pixels between the border of the panel and the data grid. And so what that does when I will actually run that thing, um, so I'm just compiling it and that's it. Now the bytecode has been created and that's the end result of the application. And automatically you will see that that application already behaves pretty well in the browser uh, because of that constraint layout policies, you see that I can resize my browser and uh, all the components are gonna follow along. Okay, so that was the design view. Now the code that was generated behind the scenes is actually this. Okay, so it's all XML driven. It's not that different from HTML or XHTML. The difference obviously is that you have a lot more uh, tags to play with, a lot more components to play with. Um, okay, so let me show you how you get to data now. So the point is to display a list of products, for instance, in that data grid. So we have a bunch of services to get to your data, and now I'm gonna go back to my concept of service-oriented client. Well, one way to expose your data is obviously through XML over HTTP, so of course we can do that, and we'll quickly do that. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm pointing here, uh, I'm pointing that HTTP service to an XML file. Now you can replace that with a you know, .asp page to a servlet. Anything that can generate XML dynamically can be used here. Some Ruby script, PHP script, whatever. Okay, this is just delivering uh, XML to my application. Okay, and so now uh, in my get data button, I can code the click event handler and say, okay, when the user will click that button, I will actually send that request for data. And the last thing you'll have to do is to actually display the data in, sorry, in the data grid. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna simplify my data grid here, uh, replace uh, all these default columns and uh, use the default behavior of my data grid. And so I need to specify the data provider and you'll use data binding to do that. So you see these curly braces? I'm gonna say here, okay, you display the last result, sorry, why don't I use the nice built-in features like code completion? Uh, the last result of that invocation of the HTTP service, and because it's an XML document, I can actually navigate uh, through the document. So there is a root node called catalog and then a bunch of nodes uh, for each product. And that's really what I want to display in my, in my user interface here. Okay, so let's do that and I'm gonna execute that thing, okay? And now I'm gonna click get data, and here we go. So we have the data, and automatically, as I showed you before, you can already sort, you can, you can move columns around, all that is, is part of the, of the default uh, user interface. Um, 
Another thing that I wanted to show you is that in addition to HTTP service, uh, we also have web service, so, and, so you could do the same thing using a web service, and in that case, instead of a URL, you would point to the WSDL file. So for all the people who said, you know, we use .NET, the kind of web services is the kind of the default way of doing this uh, on the .NET platform. So you can, do, you can use web services or service-oriented client. You can say, you know, some people tell us, you know what, we didn't really expose our you know, data or business logic in any particular, you know, SOA format. We just have these Java components in the middle tier or sometimes, you know, .NET components in the middle tier. And so we also have remote object. And remote object lets you directly invoke methods in objects deployed in the middle tier without exposing these objects as web services or without transforming the data as XML. So I'm going to say, okay, well, I still have a remote object. In this case, I'm pointing to a destination that's called catalog. Now, in a deployment descriptor, the only thing you have to do is map that logical name that I call catalog here to a fully qualified class name, okay, so that the reason we do that is to avoid hard references of class names in your code. You just map that to a real class, okay? And once you have done that, the magic starts to happen. You can start invoking methods. So like that class happens to have a get products method. I can go right to that method without exposing that object to, you know, in any particular format or transforming um, the data in XML or anything like that. And, and so now in my data grid, I can actually do something like this and say, okay, now you display the last result of the invocation of that get products method. Okay, so let's try this. And here we go. We're going to say uh, get data. And now we get the data directly from a class in the middle tier. So you have all these options to actually get to your data. And the last approach that I wanted to demonstrate in one minute to uh, get to your data in a, in a slightly different way, in a slightly different way, is using a, another approach that we call data services. And you will understand what it means. It's, it's a little less based on exposing methods. It's more based on exposing a data model. And then the client application is smart enough to identify all the changes that the end user will make to the data. So you as the client side developer, you don't have to keep track of all the changes that the end user will make. The client application, the client APIs will do that for you for free. So this is quite cool. So let's uh, work with that. So we have a data service again with a logical name that points to some kind of a data provider. And then we have an array collection, which is just a kind of a smart object. So it's an array, basically, your list of products. And because we are going to work with products here, I'm going to paste a product object, okay? And now, in my getData method, I'm going to say ds, which is my data service on the top, please fill my products array with the... Oops, something bad happened here. Uh, please fill my products array with data. Please fill products, okay? And now my data provider is even cleaner. I'm going to say my data grid, please display the product. So that's the list of products here. So let's see if you're in business. Okay, so again, a data service to point to your data, an array collection to hold the data you call fill and you tell the data grid to display the data. Now let's make it slightly more interesting and say that I want to make that data grid editable. So it's not only read only, you actually want to modify your data. Okay? So I'm going to run that thing and I'm going to click get data and I'm going to change the quantity in stock to 1 here to 900 here. Okay, and here we go. Now, nothing really impressive, you will say, but in fact, it was persisted all the way to your database, and you didn't have to write a single line of code at the client side. Now, you don't have to just believe me. We'll just refresh that application, and you see that, indeed, I have 1 and I have 900. Now, even more interesting than that, 
Remember the application with Lucinda, the call center application, and I told you that you can do, you can build these applications for free in terms of code, obviously. So imagine someone else working on the same data, okay? And so I'm going to make a change here, and I'm going to say that I'm going to make this 200, and I'm going to make this 1, and you see that automatically, because all this is built on top of messaging, um, the changes that I make uh, on the left are automatically reflected without having to write any kind of code to the right. So that's another way to get to your data and to kind of free you of having to write all that code to keep things in sync between the client and the server. The last thing that I wanted to show you, that's going to take about 20 seconds. I spoke about offline, and I uh, use iTunes as an example of that. So here is an application that was built using the exact same programming model. And I told you, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could get to your hard drive to actually find music and play that? And this is kind of annoying music, and according to my taste, but that's the only thing that I had. And so here you go. So built with the exact same programming model. And then, of course, you have all the nice things that you expect because, you know, there is vector graphics and all that stuff. All right. So I'll stop that because it's really annoying. Okay. Um, now, imagine that because obviously my one song is not really appealing. So I need to import more stuff. Uh, more songs into my application and here we go so this shows you that this application written with the exact same programming model actually has full access to your to your drive so you can actually so this is deployed as a desktop application and therefore you can access your local resources you can save data locally you can load data uh, from the file system and really the very 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 last thing that I will show you is how you build this application and I'll take only 15 seconds to do that. This is a simple application. By the way, the, the code name for this new client, the desktop client, is called Apollo. And I have some uh, nice t-shirts here. And Kevin, who is in the exhibit hall uh, across the aisle, has some more t-shirts. So if someone is interested in a t-shirt like that, I'll just throw it blindly in the room, and someone will get one. And I'll send another one here, if I can get that far. And here we go. All right. They are pretty cool, and we have more there. This is an Apollo app, exact same programming model. Now. How many of you have been in that situation where you say, the application that I have to build is really in between a desktop app and a web app? Does that sound familiar? The problem that you have today is you have to make a choice. And based on that choice, the programming model that you will use is going to be completely different. Maybe you know, HTML and JavaScript if you go web, and maybe Java or .NET, XAML, Vista stuff if you go desktop. Here is the other option. You keep using the programming model that I presented, and I will run this simple Hello World application in a browser, okay? So that's the code that you see in the back. So it says, Hello Apollo. It's running in the browser. And the way I configured my environment was to actually debug it. When I hit debug, it's actually being debugged as a desktop application. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the very same code can be deployed as a web application, and without changing a single line of code, you can deploy it as a desktop application. And in that case, obviously, you have more access to local resources and stuff like that. And now I think that I'm really out of time. If you want more info, uh, there is a, a flex booth across the aisle in the exhibit hall. Thank you very much. Last week, I rode the subway from Chambers to Midtown.